Good morning, everyone, to our great debate about open access publishing. So open access publishing, net, national strategies, challenges, and solutions. So the, the subtitle of our great debate is access to science, knowledge, and publications should be open to everyone. How can we reach this common goal? And what are the current challenges? So I just want to remind quickly everyone of the EDU code of conduct um, that um, should facilitate a fair discussion and um, everyone feeling safe to discuss um, their questions and to bring up questions. Um, so let's have a fair discussion and a fair debate. Um, so now in the next hour and 45 minutes. So I just want to give you briefly the outline. So um, I will introduce our four panelists. Three of them are here, or one of them is online. Then each panelist will give a, a brief introduction about their vision of open access publishing, also from the view of their organization and how, I, how they think it will evolve in the future. Then we will have a debate among the panelists up here um, on different aspects of open access publishing and how we can make it more open to everyone. And then um, please save your questions then for the last block um, where um, you will have the chance to ask questions to our panelists, um, also to the online um, speaker. Um, so any, anything you would like to clarify about open access publishing, any suggestions, um, how we can really move forward that it, um, publishing becomes um, open to everyone. So we have four panelists here. Um, so it's first um, Colleen Campbell. She is from the Max Planck Digital Library and she's also the coordinator for Open Access 2020. Then we have Professor Nicola Spaldin. She is online. Um, she is the chair of the working group of open science of the European Research Council. We have Francoise Rousseau-Hans. She is a coordinator of the French Unified Consortium of Higher Education and Research Organizations for Access to Di Digital Publications, or Couperin. And um, finally, we have Professor Johann Rorik, who is the executive um, director for Coalition S. So um, just to get going, I would like to, um, Pauline, to start her presentation. There we go. OK. Um, right. Open access publishing, national strategies, challenges, and solutions. Um, I've just got brief overview here. We were asked in the um, as prepare, preparation for the debate to give a, a few um, thoughts on uh, my view, our view on open access publishing to date, and my vision for the future. Although I feel <laughs> I'm certainly not the person to give um, a personal vision of the future because I am not a scientist. You are scientists, and so I would say, from my perspective. It is you who needs to decide the future for publishing or scholarly communication uh, of the, the knowledge that you create. But I can give you a, a bit of a picture of um, open access publishing to date. Here is a, a, a visualization of data uh, taken from the bibliometric tool Dimensions, which is capturing licensed data from Crossref so essentially what we have here is a view of the open access status of articles published. Um, and it's really interesting to see how much publishing has grown since the, the start of this graphic from 2013 up through 2020, uh, 2021. So this nearly a decade of publishing and it's, um, what, what do you see here? What can we, what can we see at the, the gray? you note is um, content scholarly articles published behind a paywall. So the, the license to the article is given to the publisher. No one can see it unless you pay for a subscription. Then you have uh, the green, which is articles um, available in repositories, some like the author's accepted manuscript generally. 
then um, the sort of reddish line would be made freely and openly available on the publisher platform, but where the license, uh, the, the copyright still lies with the publisher, okay? Then uh, the light yellow would be hybrid articles, meaning published in a subscription journal, but an individual article published open access. And finally, the gold on top, which is um, published in a fully open access journal. Now, I'd like to have a different view of this publishing activity that uh, you all are doing, um, normalized to 100%. So we can really see the trends and um, yeah, the proportions of open access op over time. When I look at this, I represent a library. When I look at this, it's quite concerning <laughs> because I see um, all of, to think about the money behind this publishing, right? We see here the portions in gray subscriptions, that is library budgets paying for subscriptions so that researchers around the world have access to read these articles. And the money that is invested is somewhere around um, 8 billion euro a year globally. It concerns me also because I see the, the gold um, at the top, open access publishing, which while it's, uh, it, it, we, we know that in terms of the number of journals, the, the, the majority of journals actually operate on a model, a diamond model, where there is no author payment. However, when you actually look at the number of articles published in journals, it's um, the, actually an enormous, the majority is, are articles published um, based on a fee being paid, on APC, you might know this term. And you know the situation is actually only getting worse. Um, here is just a view from uh, the Delta Think, which is a, a consulting agency with, uh, that consults with scholarly publishers about the scholarly publishing market. And here we can it highlights articles and revenue for publishers. And here, um, around 45% of scholarly articles were published in paid open access venues in 2021. So that's just under 15% of the total journal publishing market, but it's growing and it's on target. Um, well, this the market value of the open access publishing is around $1.6 billion here. And it's on target to be around 2 billion by 2024. We're looking at an open access publishing market that is growing around 14 to 15% per year. And that, rate is increasing. So that's uh, a lot of money that is attached to scholarly publishing and it's only increasing all the time. What does that mean? I want to talk about money here, uh, the financial implications of what we have in scholarly publishing today. We still have a scholarly publishing system based on subscription paywalls. It's still there. Even though open access is growing, you saw that um, the paywall is still very present. All of that content, the, the articles in gray we saw before. Um, and what does that mean for us? Well, articles are still being published behind paywalls. It means the publishers are retaining the copyrights. They can resell those articles and make even more money off of them besides the subscriptions. And just to get an idea of how much that copyright is worth to a publisher, we can just take the case in 2017 when Elsevier sued Sci-Hub um, for uh, copyright um, infringement and was awarded $15 million in damages for 100 articles. This was just an exemplary sort of um, figure, but it shows that the copyright of an article is worth at least $150,000, but we know it's much, much more. We also have the problem of the lack of transparency and the inability of, of uh, us consumers, libraries who subscribe to journals to put any pressure, market pressure to contain um, pricing. Publishers have subscription agreements with libraries, institutions around the world, and they are hidden behind non-disclosure clauses. So no one knows, one institution doesn't know what the in other institution pays. So we cannot have conversations about, well, 
you know, what is a fair price? What is an appropriate price? The pricing is based on the revenues back when we were in the days of print subscription. So there is no real um, uh, you know, basis for the pricing. And the fees are increasing year after year. And what does this mean then for institutions? Institutional investment in scholarly publishing is still tied up in this old antiquated system. The fees for subscribing are paid by libraries upfront in lump sums. In the meantime, we have this growing open access publishing market where we have this second revenue stream on top of subscription journals where uh, while the library pays a subscription on one hand, authors pay APCs to publish an individual article in those journals on top. So this double dipping phenomenon. And we also have the critical situation of author facing open access publishing fees that are hidden from any oversight. So an author, I mean, what can an author say to, to a journal that is requesting a, a, a fee for you know, $2,500 to publish open access and they feel under pressure to publish open access because the, the funder compliance, for example, we have a really uh, difficult situation financially. So that was just the, my perspective on open access. Now to the vision, my vision for the future. As I said before, I cannot give a vision for the future. This is up to you. But I can talk about uh, a medium-term vision that OA 2020 is, is, is promoting together with other partners, um, because this, I think, is, is really important. What, what I believe uh, needs to happen and what OA 2020, which, an, which is an international effort to shift scholarly publishing to open access, the, the, the principles that we are working under is that scholarly communication is part of the research process. And so any cost for publishing services, open services, should ultimately be borne by the research funders and institutions, not by individual authors. That any spending that we make as funders and institutions on scientific publishing should enable global open access for readers and authors. Everyone should be able to participate. And that any fees associated with OA publishing should be fair, reasonable, transparent, and globally equitable, something that we don't have for at present, but as a community, we should be working to achieve that. To achieve that vision, that midterm vision, uh, and um, I think we have three key challenges. A problem of incentives. Incentives because we have, this creates pressure for authors, for scientists, on the one hand, Perhaps they want to publish open access or they are compelled to publish open access by their grant funders. But at the same time, they have pressure from their institutions in order to advance in their careers. They are um, they feel pressured to publish in certain journals, which might not be open access. So they have uh, you know, they're, they're caught in this in this situation. Um, and if we if we really want to arrive at an open access system, we need to think about how do we change the incentives for authors. Alignment is another key issue. We have these two funding streams, these two financial streams going into scholarly publishing. Libraries paying subscriptions to the publishers. Grant funders um, giving funding to authors who can use that money to publish open access. And now in this hybrid world, we these two funding, these two financial streams need to be um, looked at um, in, in a way that is more uh, comprehensive. We need to see the full picture and think together strategically about how can our investments flow in such a way to support openness and not paywalls and support all authors. Um, and finally, investments, indeed. And this is what I, in my, I work on with my initiative, is how do we change our institutional investments so that they are not supporting paywalls, but they are supporting authors to publish openly. Am I okay on time? Okay. Just, oh, okay. Just to mention, um, uh, how, how do we achieve that vision? How can we address these challenges? As I mentioned before, I, my initiative focuses on the investment side, in particular, library investments in scholarly publishing. And one of the, uh, the, the tools we have to change our investments 
to support open access publishing are transformative agreements. And I won't get too far into what transformative, how they work, but I'm happy to answer questions later. They are a strategy developed by libraries to help take that investment they spend and enable authors to publish open access. It's, it's a way to shift our funding in a way that is um, not disruptive for the moment, but um, what do we achieve with these transformative agreements? It's, um, it's a way to rein in that hybrid spending of authors on APCs that happens in the wild, right? Because it, it's an agreement between the institution and the publisher, which covers, takes the subscription investments and repurposes it to cover open access publishing of an author. So it's eliminating that hybrid spending that came on top. It's also, these agreements are also introducing cost control and providing cost avoidance on fully open access APCs as because um, more and more these agreements cover not only the subscription journals, but also the fully open access journals of these publishers. And there, this lack of oversight and control that we had before with an agreement negotiated by the institution, it's um, discounts are being secured. So to lower that cost. And then just a, a mention, you know, we, we have other strategies. It's not just one strategy to transition to open access. And I think we need a multitude of strategies. Um, there's no silver bullet, as they say. Rights retention is another strategy, but my, my, my concern with it is that while it does enable access to content, it doesn't actually change this, um, the financial streams around um, uh, paywall, the, 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 the paywall oriented financial streams of the past. You know, we have situations of important subscription publishers that say, no problem, we want to maintain paywalls in our journals. Um, but you can, you can put your, uh, your uh, manuscript in a repository, zero embargo, you can put it immediately. But at the same time, they are charging very high APCs, you know, more than $4,000. And so their real revenue is coming from the open access publishing. So ultimately, institutions today cannot afford not to negotiate transformative agreements or agreements with fully open access publishers. So just to conclude, uh, the idea here is that the money we spend, institutional money we spend on subscriptions, um, if we can change that and make those funds into investments to support authors. The key here is that we allow our money to follow authors wherever they choose to publish. They're not, a, they're not required to publish where an agreement is, but at least our money is not tied up in a lump sum of a paywall toward a paywall. It's following the authors so that we can move toward an open paradigm. Our budgets are prepared to support authors wherever they choose to publish. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Colleen. So that was a lot of material already. Um, let's uh, quickly move to our second speaker, which um, is Nicola Spalding. She will um, join us online. Um, Nicola? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I think um, you have to stop sh screen sharing for me to be able to. OK, do you see my slides now? Yes. And you hear me? OK. Yes. OK, very good. Let me just start my timer so I don't run over time. So thank you very much, Barbara, for um, organizing this debate and for inviting me to join you. I'm sorry I'm not with you in Vienna, which would, would be very nice. And also thank you, Colleen, for kicking off the discussion. Certainly um, you, the points you made really resonated very much with, with, with me and I'm sure with, with many of the audience. So I'm a professor at the ETH in Zurich and my activity is in materials physics. And um, and so my community publishes ex pre-publishes exclusively on the archive. I think there's nobody who doesn't pre-post their their um, their manuscripts. And so we come from a, come from a um, perspective that's always um, promoted open open access and open science and open exchange exchange of data. I thought I would share with you um, my activities in open science because I have a, maybe a slightly unconventional perspective that's really shaped my um my vision and and might um add some some new um kind of perspective to the debate 
So I'm um, founding lead editor of Physical Review Research, which is a fully open access journal in the American Physical Society family, the Physical Review. I'm also on the scientific advisory board of Open Research Europe, which is a diamond open access journal. And I'm chair of the working group on open science of the ERC Scientific Council. Actually, it's um, I'm very recently taken over that position and I haven't actually chaired a meeting yet. So it's maybe a bit generous to, to call me the, the, the chair, but I will I tell you a little bit about my activities in all of these, um, these aspects and then wrap up at the end. So the physical review, um, was founded in 1893. It's published by the American Physical Society um, since 1913. And the family of journals before 2019, um, I've summarized here. And I've, I've kind of um, ranked, or I've, I've, I've put them spatially um, according to their, I'd say their perception in the field, their journal reputation. And so we have two um, kind of rather exclusive journals in which we we publish our kind of highest impact work, Physical Review Letters, and which is a letter style journal, and Physical Review X, which is a long um, format manuscript journal, and which is fully open access. It was founded as a fully open access journal with an author page charges model. And Reviews of Modern Physics is, a, I guess, a bit of an um, exception. It's a review article journal. And then we had our kind of, I'd say, standard family of really solid, good quality research with um, thorough peer review, which was not, um, the community did not consider to be of the kind of highest um, breakthrough research, and that was physical review A through E, um, accelerators and beams, education research, physical review applied, fluids and materials. And again, in red, I've put the, the open access journals, accelerators and beams is a diamond open access model that's supported by sponsors, corporate sponsors and institutional sponsors, so the authors do not pay page charges. And education research was an author page charges model. And so in the, in the late 2010s, it was clear that we didn't have a, a good quality um, kind of basic journal in the family where we like to publish that would continue to meet our granting agreements um, for, for those of us who had European grants. And this was really my motivation for starting um, Physical Review Research, which is... Um, we pitched or we, we, we um, positioned at the same quality level as the standard physical reviews, but to be fully open access with author page charges. And since then, um, the physical review has launched three new journals, which they're kind of um, positioning in between the um, two other parts of the family, PRX Quantum Energy and Life. I, I wanted to, I, I, see, I know this is very different from the um, EGU's publishing model, and so I thought it might be interesting for you to hear how this, this was structured. I want to emphasize that this kind of ranking, this um, journal reputation in the field, is not linked to journal impact factor. So, for example, Physical Review Letters, which I'd say is our most prestigious journal, every young person wants to have um, papers in Physical Review Letters, um, has a does not have a high journal impact factor because it's hardcore physics. Physics review applied, for example, is, is, is I haven't checked recently, but was higher. But this is more a ranking based on the perception of or the, um, the requirements that the reviewers in the community impose in order to um, authorize it or accept a, a, a paper to be published in one or other of these journals. So physical review research, I, I um, put here the kind of promotional materials from, from, from the launch um, to, to um, share with you what the physical review wanted to convey. The first was that it was fully open access. We also wanted to broaden the um, scope to welcome papers, not just in physics, but in research topics of interest to physicists. And sorry, this is a little bit of blatant advertising. We don't have a lot of geophysics, but we'd be very happy to welcome um, papers in that area. And at the time when we launched this publishing, put this um, comment, the experience you value and quality you trust, which I hated, but now I think I, I, in retrospect, I rather like it because the motivation for publishing in physical review research for many authors is really the reputation that it's part of a reputable, um, um, trusted journal family that um, was, was, is valuable to the community, but now has the, in addition, the fully open access um, access feature. So what I see now the, to be really the positives of, 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 you know, four years on from the launch is that it, it, it's achieved my personal goal of allowing physicists 
to publish in their journal Family of Choice without violating their grant agreements. That was essentially my motivation. Of course, it's a huge negative that my journal excludes researchers who don't have a large current grant. I have editorial board members in the United States who can't publish in physical review research because they don't have funds for the author page charges. Retired researchers, researchers in emerging regions and so on. And so in terms of um, equity for the physical review, I'm gonna skip back um, one, sl one slide. It's very important that we have a mechanism that we have journals available that don't require author page charges. At the moment, that's through our hybrid um, journals. Okay, Open You Research Europe. This is an experiment, I'd say. This is the journal that was established in 2021 by the European Commission. It has many interesting um, features. It's open peer review. The peer reviews get a DOI. Open data is absolutely strictly required. It accepts negative results. Um, and so this is attractive if you have negative results that you think should be disseminated to save other people um, re doing costly experiments to reproduce negative results. The model is that it's diamond open access. It's free to publish for Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe grantees only. So of course it has an issue also with equity. It's of course not free. It's um, managed by F1000 Research Limited, which is owned by Taylor and Francis. And so um, the, Europe, the European Commission pays the um, publishing costs. Um, yep, yeah, so it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's a different financial model, of course, than giving the grantees funds and then paying the publishing costs themselves. I didn't make a, I started making a pr um, positive and negative list for Open Research Europe, but I, I felt that I couldn't. It's so new and it's an exciting experiment and it's really unclear where this is going, but I'm enthusiastic that um, that such new models are being tried. So then my last activity is, as I mentioned, I chair the working group on open science of the ERC Scientific Council. And here our, um, our um, purview is to monitor open science developments in scientific communities, funding organizations, universities, research institutions, publishers, learned science societies and society, whoops, and um, track the effects of these developments on the scientific communities that the ERC serves. And then we advise the Scientific Council, we're all members of the Scientific Council, we advise the, um, the, the, the plenary on implement, implementation of strategies that allow the ERC to continue to fulfill its remit of supporting excellent frontier research. I'd say a challenge for us at the moment is um, trying to assist our grantees with um, being able to publish in the outlets that they find most appropriate for disseminating their research in a quality manner while continuing to meet their um, grant agreements. This is really, a, I'd say at the moment, a, a challenge, particularly in the um, social sciences and humanities, which I feel get a bit forgotten in the open science debate. So let me close with some thoughts. I think you know a healthy ecosystem in anything needs diversity and in, in publishing it needs diversity. We, um, I think we'll suffer if we insist on only one model as we transition to open access. And Colleen brought this across very well already. And then also that quality is, is not cheap. Quality science needs quality dissemination. And if we want to retain quality in review processes, in curation, in archiving, um, in platforms without subscription fees costs, then we have to find some kind of sustainable model to support that, that also is equitable for the whole scientific community, which is a real challenge, I think, going forward. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think we save questions until everybody's spoken. I'm looking forward to hearing the other, other presentations. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. Um, yeah, let's move on to Francoise Rousseau. Uh, I am working in CEA and I am working for the consortium Cupra with uh, uh, buying from uh, subscription for the uh, for the researchers. Look, I, I, I'll try to, to, to show what we have we've done in France, but it's the same in the world. So, uh, to, voilà. At the moment, with uh, digital uh, technology, we can do a, a lot of things with uh, scientific publishing, and uh, we we are needed uh, better sharing of res uh, research results. And we need a lot, I, I think, 
a big challenge has become uh, available. Uh, we we have to 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 uh, to do with it. So we are to ensure scientific integrity in the world because there's a lot of publication, more and more publication. It's not possible to to read everything, but there are a lot of uh, not uh, good articles. And then we have to transform the system to, to open access, and then we have to, to make some affordability for this. Uh, the, the next the, uh, speakers said about uh, price for good research, so we have to, to have a, a sustainable model for research institutions as scientific. And then we, we want to share uh, the uh, the results as soon as possible. So it, we 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 thought that uh, we we think that uh, importance in spread claim is quite good, and then we have to to look with new new fun functionality like text data mining, because uh, we can do new science with all what is already in the publication. So in France, we we have we 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 think that uh, uh, we have a necessary dialogue because a lot of institutions, first of all, is French higher education and research ministry, who has a, a strong politic policy, and we have a, a national fund fund for open science. Uh, we 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 get the money from the uh, from uh, the. Uh, uh, economy uh, with Elsevier, for example, that's quite good. And yes, we we found this with this. And then we are the consortium Coupra, with with is an association of almost 300 members, and we are negotiating with publishers for open action uh, option and uh, subscribes subscriptions too, with big deal. And um, we, we, we also share a lot of experting between all these members. And uh, some members are also many uh, initiatives like uh, creating diamond uh, journals. So I will explain a bit about diamonds after. And, and we are the, the French National Research Agency who are founding projects are against in are, uh, uh, also um, very active in open access implementation in France, and we have in France the uh, platform, the Open Archive Hall is very important for us because we, we wanted all the French publication to be on this platform for, for sovereignty. And uh, so we have to keep the copyright. We talk about it. Uh, in so we thought that uh, we we need we need to to conserve a very large bibliodiversity diversity because it's like this that we can balance the budget. So diamonds it's very supporting. It's it's very important in uh, in uh, social and humanity science. It's journal who the, the researchers has not to pay to publish or not to pay to read, and it's uh, uh, it's it's open for everybody. And and then we are global deal with traditional publisher. We we can say read and publish. We we negotiate the the, the two between. Uh, uh, and a new model become to 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 appear is subscribe to open. The subscribe to open is to uh, to be transparent. The the publisher is transparent on uh, their price and when they give uh, add uh, enough money for the subscribe uh, subscribing people, they they open the the world uh, journal. So quite uh, transparent for us. And then we, we begin to, to have deal with open access publisher, I'll tell a bit more after. And then we, we think that open repository is also very important to counterbalance the, the, the model. Uh, so, 
So in France, we, we, the French ministry launched uh, um, a study to, to, to look how, how the APC cost, and we, the, the result is that we are paying more than 30 million a year in 2020, and it's on, uh, always increasing, so we have to do something for this. Uh, even this, it's a bit serious team making, but the increase is real. So in France, we support a, uh, the French scientific publish, publisher, and because we want uh, them to develop more uh, science immediate open access, and we want to take some sustainable economic model for the journal and academic institutions. So we try diamond like with open edition who, who the journals are open access on the platform but you you can as an institution can pay some more services to make uh, the journals uh, rentable and with edp and can info we test a new model test subscribe to open with several journals uh, in France, uh, transformative agreements, uh, we, we don't have many transformative agreements uh, with uh, uh, all the subscribe and, and open access is uh, in, in the same deal because uh, I think that uh, many institutions don't want to negotiate with big publishers, but we have to do it because uh, the APC is increasing, so we we have a first experiment and uh, at, uh, experiment with a big publisher Wiley, why where all the researchers can publish with no additional quotes, even in journal uh, every journal on full OA journals. But we. We know that in the system, we have to balance the system because uh, open access publishers, if we are negotiating a lot of transformative agreements with no, co with no cost for the, for the researchers to, to publish, that's not good for the open access publishers who need the money for, uh, uh, for, for uh, be sustainable. So, uh, the French Higher uh, Education and Research Ministry and the Cooper and Consortium decide to, to experiment a negotiation with those type of publisher, and we choose three, plus Copernicus and eLife. We will experiment a new negotiation in 2023 and 2024. Because the challenge is to concentrate the budget spread about across the laboratory. It's not so easy to do it. We can make some economy with big publishers that can do the jobs. And, and then we have to estimate the value of the deal because we, we have to, to analyze uh, what, um, uh, what we have to give to the publisher. And uh, we have noticed that the founders, Ainer, uh, the founders, the French founders, is in the working group because uh, he, he can be a part of the solution. So in conclusion, in conclusion, in conclusion, excuse me, in conclusion, donc in France, we 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 want to give to to to. Um, uh, keep the, diver the, the diverse way for the publication, maintain the balance without cost drift, it's quite not easy, and, uh, and create a, a global system and scientific publishing system for the quality. So budget control, instant open access with no preferred models, sovereignty of French publication, we wanted to have all our publication on our open archive, uh, open uh, institutional uh, branch repository, and we we want to have listen, uh, licensing for text data mining. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Uh, let's move on to the last speakers. Could you share? You have slide. 
Um, Johan Rorik from Coalition S. Thank you, for, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will speak a little bit first about uh, Coalition S and the solutions that we have used to move towards full open access. And then I will, as, the, uh, as I was invited to do, speak about challenges and poss possible solutions uh, going forward. I have two slides about that at the end. First about Coalition S. Coalition S you may know, but if you don't, 28 organizations worldwide, national funders, European Commission, charitable foundations, also World Health Organization, and a number of uh, African uh, uh, organizations. Uh, this represents about $35 billion a year in research, in research funding, the, uh, with a, a total output of about 150,000 articles uh, that our funding uh, ensures. Um, Plan S has a single goal with 10 principles. Most of you may be familiar with it, but it really boils down to one single thing, all scholarly publications coming out of the funding uh, of coalition as members has to be published in full and immediate open access with the CC BY license and without an embargo. So that mean, may, may, means that our funded researchers must make sure that all peer reviewed materials are available in immediate open access and they must retain their intellectual rights in this way with, by the CC BY license. Uh, we have these 10 principles that are implemented in a coordinated way by the 28 uh, coalition as funders. The most uh, clear one of that is that we don't support publication in hybrid journals. Hybrid journals are journals that are both subscription and APC based, and we don't think those journals um, uh, will ensure the move to, towards uh, full and immediate open access. There are, of course, a number of exceptions, uh, which I will talk about in a minute. But the idea is the following. Um, and as the speakers, the previous speakers also emphasized, it, um, especially Francoise and Nicolas, um, we want an integrated approach of policies and, and solutions. I mean, it's, it's very important to have a diversity of solutions, not think that there is one silver bullet. Um, and so that's why we have these three routes. Uh, the first route is the easiest one in a way, you pay for it. Uh, publication in full open access journals is compliant and financially supported. So you pay for it or you publish in a diamond open access journal and of course that is fine. Route two is the, more, is the most complicated one. It, this is for uh, those researchers who still want to publish in subscription journals and that is allowed under Plan S, but the uh, researcher has to make sure that a copy of the author accepted manuscript is deposited in a repository of publication, which yields all sorts of problems that I will talk about in a minute. And then there is route three, publication in journals that are under a transformative arrangement or a transformative uh, arrangement like the ones that uh, Francoise and Pauline uh, talked about. So uh, these are, uh, see, since we have these three routes, I'm sorry, since we have these three routes, we developed a, a, a journal checker tool for our researchers. So a journal checker tool basically is a search engine where you type in your favorite journal uh, your favorite funder, the funder that you have funding from, and your university, and that will give you some information about how you can publish open access in those journals. For instance, the information about the university will give you uh, access, immediate access to whether your university has concluded a transformative agreement with a specific publisher, and so you know that you are covered, you, you don't have to pay. Uh, same thing for the funder, the information about the funder will give you access to information about whether the funder will pay for the fee in your uh, in your favorite open access journal. So this is a very useful tool for researchers, it's, it's also being, being used quite actively, I should say. And then, of course, about transformative agreements, I, Pauline and Francoise already talked about uh, this, this is these models where uh, there is an agreement actually between uh, funder, between uh, libraries uh, essentially and publishers to not only have access to reading but also to publishing. So these are variously called transformative agreements, transformative journals, subscribe to open. And it happens at the level of the library consortia. And that's why it's very important, as Colleen already said, to really uh, coordinate very clearly between the funders and the, the, the libraries and to make sure that those that funding is coordinated to pay for, for these, the, these deals. Um, 
Transformative agreements have led to an, a massive increase in open access articles. Uh, as you can see, this is one of the figures that comes from ESAC that I, that I always use to show this. So it's really contributed massively. Um, um, route two and rights retention, I, I recognize the problems that Colleen sees with it, but for, uh, we do have the problem of those fields and people who still want to publish in subscription journals. Authors then sign copyright transfer agreements with the publisher that prevent uh, depositing a, co uh, a copy immediately. So now I'm going to move into how we solve that tricky problem. Um, and that, that's why we developed the rights retention strategy. The rights retention strategy means that um, the grant conditions of our the grant conditions that we impose on researchers already say, look, all the research that's coming out of this grant is licensed CC BY. So it's a preemptive move, if you, if you like. The, the, it's a contract that stipulates all of the research coming out of this is CC BY, whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, don't take our money. Um, so that means that, that that license is already stipulated. And of course, the authors have to repeat this by uh, when submitting to the publishers. They have to assert uh, a CC BY license on their paper. And this allows them to retain sufficient intellectual rights to deposit a copy of the, that AAM in a repository at publication. Now, the beauty of this is that since that CC BY license is in place before the copyright transfer agreement, it takes legal precedence over anything that might be in the copyright transfer agreement, and it gives sufficient intellectual rights to the, to the author. So this is a very important uh, aspect that can actually be used also by by researchers who are not uh, recipients of uh, Coalition S grants. So basically all the researcher needs to do is this, uh, put in the article that they submit to the publisher, this language saying, look, I assert a CC BY license on this article, and, and then they can deposit the AAM in a repository. And the publisher can retain full rights on the version of record, which is an aspect that is often forgotten in uh, uh, discussions about the rights retention strategy. Of course, publishers don't like this at all. They put publish, they put authors in difficult situations, so they will um, um, have contracts that contradict the grant agreement. Some publishers want to delete the rights retention language. Very often, also, they say, "Look, we will steer you to the gold open access uh, part of the journal when you publish in." Uh, um, a, a hybrid journal without telling the researchers that the funder will not pay for that. So there is a lot of confusion going on there, but the, 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 the idea is very clear. We think that all, uh, publishers can reject these articles with the rights retention language, which they almost never do. They just deflect them to the gold open access option. Um, but at the same time, we see that rights retention is uh, receiving a lot of support. I'm going just to give you, I'm going to give you a few: UNESCO, G6, EUA, European Council, which is actually going to be reinforced this year with, under the Swedish uh, presidency. And there's many universities now that have adopted rights retention policies: 16 in the UK and, and four in Norway. And what this basically means is that the university will back up the researcher applying the rights retention strategy, basically saying to the publisher, if you want to come after our researchers, you will have to deal with us. So it's a very strong strategy on behalf of these universities. Um, we also uh, pursue price and service transparency. This is also something that Colleen mentioned. We need to have more transparency in what we are paying for. It's ridiculous that we are still paying as a function of subscriptions for paper journals that, that last yeah, negotiated 20 years ago or so. So we have invited all publishers to participate in this journal uh, uh, comparison service. Uh, uptake there is relatively slow, but Wiley has participated in it. We think this is a good way of giving librarians uh, insight into prices and comparison of prices. Uh, because again, we think we need to lower down those prices and understand better what um, these prices are about. In this context, I would like to mention Copernicus. Copernicus gives very good insight into their prices on their, on their website. I checked this morning, they, they are quite open about how, how the prices build up. So, I mean, since I was asked, or we were asked to say something about Copernicus, so let me say something nice. <laughs> um, we also subscribe to the Diamond Action Plan. This, so this is the action plan for Diamond Open Access. Uh, Diamond OA uh, is uh, uh, not only 
publishing at no cost to authors and readers, but it is also scholar-led, which means that the journals and the decisions and the leadership of the journals are in the hands of the academic community. That is, that is very important. It's not just free to authors and readers, but it's also in the hands of the academic community. And this is a plan, there's a plan to develop common resources for this. Um, um, and uh, this was initiated by INA Coalition and Operas in Science Europe. And uh, over 160 organizations have signed up to that. So what we want to really do there is build capacity and, and uh, build uh, the thinking around Diamond Open Access. In this context, there are two projects that are being taken forward, the Diamas project and the Craft Away project. EC sponsored projects that want to create a landscape study of Diamond Open Access publishing in Europe because very often these journals are completely scattered and isolated. So what we want to do is to bring them together and to create capacity and efficiency uh, in, in this domain, uh, also on, on the global level. About challenges, I still have two minutes left. One minute, okay. Challenges. Pauline already mentioned it, inequity. Gold open access is inaccessible to many researchers globally. Nicola also mentioned this. Um, waivers are ineffective and very often viewed as neocolonial. That's a problem. Research assessment. There's an unhealthy focus on the final version of an article published in a prestigious journal as the only currency that matters. Um, I'm an editor. I find it harder and harder to find reviewers. Why? Because reviews are not appreciated. They're not valued for career advancement. Control of uh, outputs is still in the hands of commercial publishers, and that's basically a free handout, handout to, uh, from the public to the private sector. It's not something we should tolerate. And finally, there's research waste. It takes too long to get articles published, in, even in 2023. Reviews are not recycled, and preprints are not sufficiently valued. So here I uh, propose, I, I note some solutions. I don't propose them. Um, inequity, we could make open access more transparent and function of purchasing power parity, something that we are working on with, with Colleen as well and a number of others. We could strengthen diamond open access publishing. This is definitely something that's needed. We could value all contributions to the research process, which is now currently being undertaken uh, under the auspices of COARA, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. And I firmly think that control of all content-related elements should be within the academic community. I think it is scientists who should make decisions about papers, not uh, active scientists, um, who uh, and should own uh, the, the, all content-related elements. That's why we have to pursue rights retention via CC BY, push diamond open access, and to avoid research waste, we have to really move to open peer review, which is something, again, that is practiced uh, at Copernicus, I've heard. And we should review, uh, uh, make sure that reviews are valued as much as articles um, in new, the new research assessment. And this can be also done, of course, by developing peer review curate models. So these are post-publication peer review. You publish the preprints, then comes the review, and then the article is, the final version of the article is published. So these are solutions that I will see, that I see being developed going going forward in the next five to 10 years. Sorry, took more than a minute. <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, all the, our speakers. So I think that was already um, a lot of ground that was covered and many different aspects um, were actually addressed. But now um, we want to continue with some specific questions um, could you maybe display the slide from my presentation? So um, now I have questions to the panelists. Um, so let's start with the first one. So are agreements between individual publishing, publishers and institutions the way to go forward to the future? We heard quite a bit about agreements, transform, transformational agreements and others. Um, so. Is this really the solution? Is this really the way to go for forward? Maybe Colleen? Yeah, happy to take that. Um, I would not call it a solution. I think it is a pathway and it's a necessary pathway from my perspective. I mean, I highlighted before the spending that we have uh, that is occurring in scholarly publishing. And so if we don't negotiate with publishers, I mean, if I may say so, this negotiation with publishers where money is actually already being spent, not only is it a way to um, get oversight and control of the, that spending, but it is also a, um, 
a framework for institutions, the research communities, um, anyone who is spending money on the scholarly publishing system to begin to reorient those investments, the, all of the processes, the personnel, the, you know, the workflows, which are still very much rooted in the, the old you know, antiquated print system. These are negotiating with the publishers, you are forced to look at, oh, how much money is actually being spent on APCs? How much is actually being spent on subscriptions? What do those, what, how does that amount of money relate to the actual output of my institution, my region, my country? And this process then will uh, allows institutions to rethink how that money is flowing and adapt their budget structures to support open access publishing. So it's not only a question of the immediate you know, savings, reducing cost, it's actually a framework for us to metabolize this transition as, as an academic community. Thank you. So, Nicola, do you want to um, say? Something about that. It's just a, a small addition. I, I very much support what Colleen just said from the with my publisher's hat on from the perspective of a small society publisher, um, which is very keen on um, transformative agreements. But we're very much at the back of the queue for the negotiations. Right. And I think um, many society publishers are much, much smaller than the commercial publishers. And so it's challenging, I think, for um, for to, to have transformative agreements with all with many academic institutions. I don't know what the solution is to that, but it's it's certainly an issue. Thank you. Anyone else? Jan? Yes, I agree with Colleen actually that this is really very much part of the solution. I think don't, don't think it's the solution, but it's part of the solution. And I think this fits in a, in a much broader strategy that we should have as an academic community of taking back control. Uh, so taking back control of these of, of these transformative agreements is is a is, is a way of entering negotiations with the publishers. But we should also take back control of other icons. I mean, we've let this thing come much too far. I mean. I became a publisher, uh, uh, an editor back in '99, and the, the 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 relationship with the publisher back then was a very different one. I had a one-page contract that stipulated what I had to do, and it was really much more like a gentleman's agreement. When I stopped working for Elsevier in 2015, I had a 27-page contract that basically uh, tied me to everything I did and tied everything I did into the company. So this is crazy. I mean, why did we ever let this happen? It was basically like, you know, the, the typical example of the frog in the in the hot water. We let it happen because we didn't see it. We didn't see the temperature increasing. And now we're realizing that we actually lost control of many things and should take back control. And this, all of these items, rights retention strategy, transformative agreements, support for diamond, are part of the same thing, academy taking back control. Okay. Uh, no, I agree with I agree with this because uh, I, I think that we have to, to make a, a lot of things to do to manage. Yeah, th thank you. I mean, just to, to follow up on um, the first question. Um, so in, in these negotiations and um, agreements, so for us, of course, at EDU, it's, it's often the questions, why do um, institutions not prioritize full open access publishers like Copernicus? So maybe, Nicola, do you want to start? So in what, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the context of your, of your, of your question, Barbara. I think institutions are, are certainly in favor of fully open access um, publishers and journals. Did I misunderstand? Oh, I see, in the selection of negotiation partners. Maybe because they, I, the point I made earlier that they're probably generally not the largest. And, and so um, as an, I think it's a bit like the EU negotiates with um, the United Kingdom before Switzerland over, um, <laughs> over um, post-Brexit um, 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 commitments because it's so much bigger, right? And, and so the institutions will tend to first go with the really big publishers. The open access publishers tend to be smaller maybe. But that's just a, an opinion. I don't have any data to support that. 
I Thank think you. The, the biggest problem is it's because the budget they don't come don't come from the library, and uh, so we have to 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 look at how to keep to to concentrate some money. Then we have to do some economy with the big publishers, or we have to look from the laboratories to to help. It, it's just it's just because it's easy to pick to take the money from the library and then negotiate transformative agreements. It's more complicated to to, to take every uh, all the money in the laboratory who are spread. Yes, um, I think it's also a problem of, of capacity. I mean, you know, many libraries or library consortia simply don't have the capacity to, to negotiate with the smaller publishers. And I don't think there's an easy solution to this. Maybe one solution would be to use standardized agreements, you know, where you have standardized factors that you can sort of input and then, you know, a figure rolls out. That's, that's one thing that can be done. Another thing that can be done that I like very much actually is subscribe to open, which is a relatively simple solution to come to a transformative agreement. You basically say, look, you know, we take the subscription as a basis, and when we reach a certain sum, we will make the journal open, uh, op completely open access. And everybody submitting there can also submit in open access, which makes the journal very equitable. Uh, subscribe to open is a very equitable system. Um, even more so than transformative agreements, I think, because the, those are very often limited to specific countries, whereas as to always really like a, a global solution for the set of journals that adopt it. So there are solutions, but of course, if you are already a full open access journal, then with, with APCs, you can't use the S2O subscribe to open solution. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a tricky problem of capacity, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pulling this going to stay no, but I, I think everything has been already said, right? It's a question of the investments. Uh, we saw before, we have 10 billion US dollars invested in subscriptions, whereas it's a 1.6 billion market of open access publishing. I mean, for necessity, we have to start where you get the biggest bang for your, for your buck, right? But and, uh, this has Francois said, so I agree with everything that Nicola said and, and jo uh, uh, Johan. I just also wanted to, um, make a comment, we've been working on open access for 20 years now, right? The Berlin Declaration outlined two pathways to open access, gold open access and green open access. And, um, you know, it, it feels to me as if in recent years, finally, we are coming together and thinking about it's not one or the other, but it's very much um, a, a multitude of pathways and uh, not one solution will get us to this vision of openness. We have to embrace all of these strategies. And that is happening now. So I would, perhaps in the past, uh, fully away publishers have not been prioritized. My own institution actually took the perspective, where do my authors publish? Let's, and we, we analyzed that and we could see that the majority of publishing, 80% of the publishing was happening with 20 publishers. And that actually included five fully open access publishers. And therefore we negotiated agreements with five, those five fully OA publishers. Um, it, it, but we are in a phase of transition. You know, it, it, we're getting there is all I can say, right? Now that we're embracing this idea that we need to embrace multiple strategies. Just a, another question um, following up on this one. I mean, you talked about the um, archive repositories and uh, for example, Hull Archive in um, France. Isn't that kind of a uh, movement then against the idea of, of open access publishing? I mean, doesn't that really um, create then kind of a contradiction of um, not supporting the full open access publishers? I don't think so. We we need the two because you know I think that institution archive like Al in France, for example, where we are a lot of things. You have a, a French vision and we can share, but it's it's not the same as sharing in a journals who the researchers know the committee, the committee editorials. So it, it, I think it's very complementary. In one way, you, you can give a, an institution laboratory vision, 
and, uh, and in where we were published. And in other way, it's a community. It's a, it's it's how you, the community can spread uh, their uh, share their their values. So we don't. It's not necessary to oppose it. Someone else. Hmm. Yes, I, I also think repositories uh, uh, make research available, right? That is still behind the paywall. Um, via the rights retention strategy, for instance, to make sure that those outputs are also available. Uh, and it puts pressure, I think, on publishers to move more fa faster to, towards open access in, in one way or another. Uh, like I said, I mean, subscription journals can do this by, via subscribe to open, which is a very fair system, you know. I mean, because basically it ensures their subscription revenues. I mean, you can set as a publisher the the revenue that you want to have, and then the libraries can subscribe to it. And the result is massive because everything becomes open access, and everybody can submit to open access. So I don't understand why subscribe to open is not embraced more fully, especially by smaller pu subscription publishers. Um, and but, you know, if they don't want to do it, then, of course, we as an academic community have to put pressure by saying, look, all the AAMs are going to be in a repository that will push you towards open access. There is no choice. There is no other choice anymore. Subscription is 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you. Nicola, you want to say something? Just to um, add, that I think the importance of the preprint archives, um, which I think were an important lever in um, developing the culture of open research dissemination, even um, before commercial or open access was, was really discussed, the idea that the research results should be really be immediately available while they're being peer-reviewed peer at a very early stage and um, disseminated. Yeah, um, okay, let's move on to, to the next question. Um, so in, in the last years, um, in several countries, we, we have felt kind of movements or, or pushbacks um, that advise scientists against publishing in gold open access um, journals or paying APCs. So one example, for example, is the French CNIS, where um, so among three CNIS researchers, actually the idea of this um, discussion came up. So it's, it's Denis Didier Rousseau and Janik Angran, the audience, where we thought, uh, so we are all CNIS researchers, and we get these guidelines that do not pay any APCs anymore, and you cannot ask in your proposals um, for um, APCs, um, and you cannot include that. So we, we are getting quite limited where we can publish. For example, um, we heard already authors that um, said, well, we, it's, it's getting harder and harder to publish in Copernicus journals. And so um, we tried to ask CNS about that. We invited several people to this discussion, but no one responded. So I hope that maybe you can um, tell us um, so why are these um, guidelines? I mean, it's not only limited to France, of course. It's it's also in Denmark. I think in the UK there are some similar um, movements. So maybe Francoise could start and elucidate us. <laughs> yes, I love because it's so nice. Yes, I think that uh, what happened it's when the scenarios. Uh, look to to the increase of IPC so they they have a bit fear and then they, they, they told they ask the their scientists not to publish in gold open access so it's quite radical and but it's not um, my policy uh, I think that we need to be moderate with this those kind of things so I think you should ask the CNRS. We try it. They don't answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Colleen. I just have a few thoughts, uh, not specifically about the CNRS, but um, generally, oh, uh, if I may. Um, I think there are a lot of different issues at play here, and there's a lot of conflation of ideas because scholarly communication is extremely complex. And so we have to be very careful about our definitions. Um, 
gold open access, right? That, that uh, sometimes you have, um, th there is in some parts of the world, this persistence that open access is of lesser quality, right? That, that still persists today. After 20 years, we've been working on this, but there, the, you, you do have this. I think initially it took time for open, fully open access gold journals to mature and achieve their recognition, but I think we are all very comfortable today in, in recognizing um, the quality of journals. And I think that this, this old binary thinking of green or gold um, is still very entrenched and we need to move beyond that and, and see the value of both modes of, of open access. And But then I think we have to separate this notion of paying APCs. Like what are we actually talking about when we talk about an APC? Um, are we actually just talking about author-facing payments? Are we talking about the price point of an APC, right? Is it the, it's not an APC is bad. Maybe it is the, the level of the APC that is not acceptable. Um, an APC is a unit of measure and it's an actually a very transparent unit of measure of how much scholarly publishing costs the academic community. Um, so I think that there's probably a lot tied up there. And, and, and of course, we're looking for some level of um, understanding of how to deal with the increase in research. In research is increasing, what, 14, 15% um, annually, but institutional budgets may are flat, right? Or, or maybe, so <laughs> how, do we, how do we address that challenge? And I think that, um, yes, by, through negotiation, but also through finding ways to re, you know, take that investment and moving it over to Diamond Publishing, other publishing entities, we can have a little bit more um, control of the overall costs. Johan? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, you want to add something? Maybe just to reiterate the points that I think everybody made earlier about transparency. I think everybody agrees that quality publishing has a, has a cost but who pays that cost and how much it should be is often not very transparent. And I think that's a lot of the resistance to um, the author pays model has come from this lack of transparency. And, and it's of course, particularly difficult during this transitional period where everything is changing and how we pay for publishing is, is, is changing. It's, it's, and transparency is perhaps even, even more important during this period. Thank you. Yeah, so, so now we, we heard a lot about, well, we have to make it transparent that publishing is associated with costs. I mean, no matter how we call it, whether it's diamond open access or gold open access, um, publishers have to live, right? I mean, um, publishing an article um, is associated with the cost. So now, um, what could you um, now recommend us um, to the scientists here in the room or also online, um, when we um, face these guidelines we get from our um, universities or institutions um, across Europe, um, that we are restricted on where we can publish and in what um, type of journals we can publish, how can we actually respond and say, well, we, we want to have freedom where we want to publish, it should be open access, but we don't want to be limited. Um, shall I start? Uh, yeah, I think those assessment systems need to change. I mean, I know that there are in many countries in, in Europe as well, these lists that are based on Scopus or based on other rankings, private rankings, world uh, rankings, uh, that tell you where you can publish and what a prestigious journal is and what a non-prestigious journal is. Um, Coalition S has taken a very clear stand on that. We have our principle 10, which says we will not take into account the venue where you publish, the prestige of the journal, the impact factor, all of that is irrelevant for us. We will only look at the quality, the inherent quality of the article when you submit for a grant with us. So that's a big statement. And that has now been taken up as well by this organization, uh, COARA, Coalition for Advancing uh, Research Assessment. 400 organizations in Europe, institutions and organizations have signed it and are willing to move towards a new assessment of research that gets rid of these kinds of uh, indicators. And that I think is something that all researchers should be aware of 
and push in their university, push their university to, do, to become part of that, so to contribute to the change uh, that we absolutely need. It can no longer be the case that we only assess researchers on the basis of the numbers of articles that they have published in prestigious journals. It's ridiculous. That's not, that's, that's not how we work, right? I mean, how do we value the work of editors? How do we value the work of reviewers? We don't, and we are not doing a good job there because, I mean, as I said, it becomes more and more difficult to find reviewers, it becomes more and more difficult to find editors because the work is simply not valued. At, at your annual evaluation. That's a very good point. And, and uh, for those of you who were here on Monday, there was a huge discussion in this room, I believe, on how to assess research beyond citations. We, we cannot only count papers. There's so much more we do. Yeah. Hmm. But for instance, one of the things that, that Coalition S funders have done is, when, and this is something that almost all the funders agree on now, is when we, when we have um, when we assess researchers when, who apply for a grant, they are asked to give a, a narrative CV. So basically, it's a, a CV where you say, okay, you give us your 10 best publications and explain to us why these are your 10 best publications. You, applicant, you explain to us. And that's one way of doing it. It's not perfect, of course, but nothing is perfect. But at least you get a chance as a researcher to explain why you think these are your 10 best publications. And yeah, it, it's not about a numbers game anymore. Then. It's about a, a, the game of convincing someone that you're doing a good job as a researcher and why you think that you are doing a good job. And the answer cannot be because I have three articles in Nature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's not. Because, mm -hmm. we don't take, because we don't we don't take that to be an argument anymore. Mm. Right. Thank you. So someone else who wants to comment on that question. So how how should we react? How how should we? justify that, that we want to publish where, where we want to publish? <laughs> Maybe I can um, jump in. So actually, when I was preparing for this this session, I was looking at the um, European Geophysical Union's publishing, and you, you have a um, pie chart of exactly the costs associated with, with each article and where the, the APCs go to. And this, I think, is extremely helpful um, to a to an author in understanding the cost of the page charges and also in response to your question about um you know raising awareness of, of where what the costs the costs are so that was that was a, um I, if every publisher did that it would be very helpful Pauline I think it's also a very simple question of data collection I mean I think that uh, faculty senates you know the governance of um, the academics at an institution and the research office and the libraries and the grant funders, we all need to be able to see exactly where authors are publishing and then bring in the, 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 the information around the costs that are coming from different places, right? Coming from the grant funders, coming from the libraries. And all of these actors in scholarly communication need to sit down together with that data um, taken through a Chris system or by applying a fund code when you go to pay an APC so that you can track that money and then look at it together and, and then you know, have some conversations. But it's really going to take having the data and sitting down together the different factors. Thank you. Oh, Francoise, you want to add something? I think I would. I, no one, uh, no things to. to, to complete. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think we got already an idea, I mean, uh, where the open access movement is, is going to and, and maybe what we can also do on um, to talk to our funders, to talk to our institutions. Um, so now we, we still have some time for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions also online, um, so uh, Denis will actually watch the chat and uh, let us know if, if there are some questions in the chat. But yeah, if you have questions, yeah, so I see Janik. Yeah, so first, thank you to the, the, the speakers and the organization for this, this uh, good debate because it's very interesting and it's a very uh, important subject. We are quite worried at the moment with the evolution and so on. So I am managing editor of a journal 35 years old. A journal uh, hold by the, owned by four uh, learning societies. And uh, three years ago, we moved from uh, hybrid to 
world open access. The average cost of APC for the journalist eight and below 800 euros, so it's very low. So, so I think we are worried when you uh, you see the 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 fight, especially scenarios and so on, about APC because if you we have more and more difficulty to get uh, uh, authors paying for this APC when you have this uh, this advertising of unethical and so on, uh, which is very unfair. Um, so you forget something when you, you are fighting against APC, it's the APC that drives the, uh, the information to the authors how cost the uh, publication before researcher and no idea how cost the publication. When the journal had to put what is the cost for open access, which is in fact the cost, the, the, the revenue, uh, they discovered that it can go up to 9,000. And this is something, uh, if APC disappear, and especially if you go to Diamond, a system, this transparency will disappear. And as a researcher, we'll not know how much it costs. Me, what I like when I am authors, I go, I pay the APC, I can say, it cost me this year 900 euro, 2,000 euro, and so on. If I go to Diamonds, my institution will be not able to tell me how much it costs to me. So how you will solve this issue if you do too much uh, agreement between the publisher and the institution and doesn't pass by the researcher? That is my question. Okay. Who, who wants to start? Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I completely understood the question, so you will forgive me. But I, I think that the the same question of transparency also applies to diamond publishing. I mean, in an ideal world, I think you also should have transparency of costs for diamond publishing. I don't think so. My institution is unable to tell me how much it costs the single article by that passing a diamond agreement. Yes, but th that is also a matter of, of, of capacity, right? I mean, the, the, what we need to do is align in diamond journals much more and have a, a, a kind of a center that, that would help understand assessing the, those costs. Understand the difficulty, but okay, I understand you are in transition period, it's difficult, but how many small uh, fair uh, gold open access journal will disappear before the transition is over? That's the question. Yeah, no, that. Yeah, so how can we communicate that that diamond open access is not free? Right? No, no, diamond open access is not free. I, no, nobody says that, right? I mean, there are costs associated with it, and those costs, of course, need to be need to be made transparent. And that's not the case now either, because there's a lot of voluntary work involved. I mean, for instance, I'm the editor of a diamond open access journal. I could not tell you to the do to to the to the euro what it costs per article. I I cannot because you know, I work for the journal for free. Do I count my work? Don't I count my work? It's for free because I don't no longer work at university. I'm, in, um, you know, so so I do it in my free time. Do I count that? Do, don't I count that? Do I only count the the copy editing and typesetting costs at Silicon Chips in India? Do, do I count the developer time of the people at Janeway who work for the Open Library of Humanities? I mean, we have a ballpark figure, but we don't have it, and we don't have it because of capacity. You need someone who dives into the figures and does that calculation for you. But Open Library of Humanities is a, is a very small publisher. They have like 30 journals and very small capacity. So that's why we need to build capacity as well, to be able to have a, to get an insight into those costs so that we can compare advantageously, I hope, the cost of diamonds to the cost of gold, gold open access and other publishers. Um, but so, I agree we have a problem there. This needs to, that's why we have the Diamas project and the Crawfordway project to try and build capacity in this in this sector in diamond open access publishing. Yeah, so Colleen? I just wanted to add, I, I mean, it, it, the problem that you surface, uh, get back to what I've said before, and it's a problem that our, um, our budget structures in academia, in research, are not oriented around openness yet. And, and this is what we need to, we are working through this transition. I think of, it, just to mention now the scholarly societies, because we hadn't really gotten into that yet, 
and you know, in the past, scholarly societies funded their activity through this revenues that they made in subscriptions. But if we move to um, a, a system of open access publishing, then we, we, we see this and then, we, you know, it begs the question, well, the library has been paying for these subscriptions and that money was actually used to support all kinds of other activities that are not necessarily or strictly related to scholarly publishing. So is it appropriate that the library funds babysitting at the annual conference of the society, right? It's a, it's, it's a question, maybe, maybe that is the case or, or maybe the, 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 the way this funding is, the, the way we support research today yeah, we need to adjust the budget structures to support all of the activities that as ac that the academy values. Um, yeah. And if I may add, the, the, the problem is not just transparency, huh? because um, but I mean, the scholarly societies, I mean, you see it in my bottom. Um, scholarly societies, some of the scholarly societies, even the biggest ones, are very transparent. You can look at their books every year. What you will see is that some of them don't just pay for the babysitting at conferences, they pay for $1 million salaries of their directors. Is that where the money of the library should go? I mean, mm. you know, these are, these are things that we really should ask ourselves as, as the scientific community. Um, yeah, yeah so, so I guess the first step would be transparency, but then we also have to understand what, what's behind this, what behind these costs. So I think we have another question from the audience. Yeah, uh, many thanks for the interesting talks. Uh, you both, several of you mentioned transformative agreements, and I'm not sure to fully understand what it is. So could you please elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, okay, Colleen, of course. <laughs> sure. Um, actually, wondering if I could show a slide, it would be easier to show you. <laughs> but um, a transformative agreement. Um, no, I don't have them here. It's basically, um, in the past, the, the library of your institution would have a subscription agreement with a publisher, and they would pay an, a lump sum to en enable access for all of the researchers at the institution. I mean, now, in a trend, and in the meantime, authors who wanted to publish open access in those subscription journals, because the majority are actually hybrid journals, they would pay APCs on top. Now, the we know um, that the money spent globally in subscriptions, about $10 million and more, actually is sufficient to sustain those same subscription journals in an open access publishing model. Um, because if we look at how many articles are published in those journals, um, divide that $10, million, uh, $10 billion dollars by the number of articles and you come out with a fee of around $2,000, right? And if you look at the average APC price point today, it's almost, you know, it's a little bit higher, but generally the money is already in the system. So based on that knowledge, the transformative agreement is really any sort of agreement where the money that the libraries used to pay for reading access is actually repurposed and covers open access publishing of the institution's authors, plus, of course, the reading access of everything still behind the paywall in, in those journals or by that publisher. Um, so it, it's basically saying, we're not going to let you earn APCs from our authors. We're going to, um, we will cover the cost for the authors to publish open access as governed by this agreement and using the old subscription funds to do so. And it, they, it has many names, read and publish, publish and read, um, PAR models, yeah, et cetera. But it's basically the, the institutions paying for open access publishing plus reading, a little bit of reading is still needed, even though we could question the value of access to read journals today with so um, the expectation is really, fo the focus is today on publishing. I hope that explains it. Does this answer your question? Hmm. So another question? Hmm. Yes, uh, you were thinking, I mean, we are running the system actually as a researcher because we are, um, we are editors for free, we are reviewers for free. So we are fueling the system. Can we just stop doing this? Like, okay, we stop reviewing if you don't 
provide us with an agreement or something like this? Nicola, did you get the question? Hmm? Yeah, there was an um, interesting announcement a, a, a week ago. I think the entire editorial board of Neuroscience and Elsevier Journal um, quit en masse because Elsevier would not lower the author page charges. It's a gold open access journal and have founded a competing um, society journal, which is a very interesting um Kind of unionistic approach, I thought. So this, I mean, this is this is for sure happening, and it's a very good point. I mean, we, in principle, control the process. We can all choose to not publish in expensive journals. This is um, our prerogative, um, absolutely. Yes, and th this has been tried in the past as well, right? There's been the Elsevier bon boycott in around 2011. The, the the trouble is to sustain this, and also, I mean, I would love for more journals to flip from subscription to um, open access it's something i did myself in 2015 with the journal lingua at elsevier which is one of the cases of you know in declarations of independence of journals so we set up a new journal and you would like for this to happen more often the, the trouble is that there is no infrastructure in place for this to happen if you do this you're on your own you have to basically reinvent the wheel as a, as a journal and one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm working on also in the context of the Diamas project is to make sure that that infrastructure becomes available, that there is a portal that you can go to as a prospective editor or as a prospective rebellious editor, where you can pluck the things off the shelf, the guidelines, the submission system, even the, mo the, 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 the financial support for your journal, and just set up your journal in a week's time. That's the world that I'm dreaming of. <laughs> And then you can see much more of these declarations of independence and flips, right? Because it will become easy. Um, that's one way of doing it. I see you not being no. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Francoise, you want to add something? <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, I, I look, for example, in, you can see with the APC, the, the, the decrease of the... the um, is the increase of the APC in Elsevier. Uh, it was a good job because some years it came more than ten photons, and then we we can't see we we can't see it because when you are paying an APC thousand on the next after two thousand on the we can't see it, but the increase the 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 increase the APC because of if the the, the model flip I don't have enough money uh, as the, the same money as they have with the sub subscription. So, so that's quite um, uh, a period, uh, an, inter an interesting period, and we, we have to be very aware that that we we won't see it with the big publishers who take too much money to decrease a little for 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 increase some more fair model with the, with the scientists. Okay, thank you. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just have a, a comment. Uh, I uh, fully support open access and uh, this uh, transformative agreements seem a wonderful idea. But uh, during this transition period, as you mentioned, institutions will look uh, at uh, uh, what's the main proportion of the publications. Uh, so have you considered then, especially in countries with low budget and institutions with low budget, uh, uh, what will happen uh, um, when um, only a certain portion of, uh, of uh, the authors will be uh, then um, covered. They will be able to have uh, access to diamond uh, uh, publication because of these transformative agreements. And then uh, there will be a significant proportion, especially in countries with not so much budget and institutions with not so much budget that uh, will not be covered. And uh, if uh, uh, we're talking about small publishers, or uh, researchers who do excellent research, but uh, maybe in a field that's uh, more of a niche, uh, so then they will certainly not be covered. So this will uh, uh, be, I think, uh, 
difficult uh, situations. So how uh, can that be taken into account? Yeah, that's the problem of a tr transition, right? I mean, things do not move at the same pace, um, but but there are um, various venues and discussions where these discussions take place, uh, like for instance at Berlin 16, where various negotiators from countries come together and exchange information about, you know, transformative agreements and how these take take place. Uh, I think we need much more collaboration of this type, not just for transformative agreements, but also for other types of publishing, uh, other types of agreements like subscribe to open, subscribe to open has a community of practice where they discuss how to do this. I think the same is true for diamond. I mean, we need, we need much more collaboration and exchange to make sure that indeed the entire world is covered and that, you know, these things are negotiated in a, in a, in a fair way. The problem is also that countries are organized very differently. This is something that I find also in our work at Coalition F. Um, it's not always easy to see how a country, who, who, who has which responsibility in a specific country. So in certain Eastern European countries, for instance, I mean, they have funders, but it's the ministry that is much more responsible for things uh, like, for instance, subscriptions. Um, in other countries, it's the libraries that are responsible, the library consortia. It's, 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 and so it's not, not easy to just get a full overview of how, the, how every part moves in, in specific countries. And so we need much more work and interaction there. If I may just add, I mean, your comment is a great one. I really appreciate that. And I think that if we, in the work that I've been doing around transformative agreements, just trying to increase the knowledge, because this is a new thing, right? We hadn't negotiated open access before. So there's a lot of capacity building that we're doing. And I think that, uh, well, it, through the discussions, we now have a, a better understanding that <clears throat> even in low income countries, money is being paid to large commercial publishers for subscription access. You know, we think that there are charitable initiatives out there that are taking care of anything, and that's just not the case. Um, but um, so actually this opportunity to have a transformative agreement is very often there, right? That because the money that they're already investing would be fully sufficient to cover um, the open access publishing. And even better if we can work on the, the pricing of publishing services so that they are um, you know, differentiated based on the different geographical and economic contexts. And this is what we need to work on um, next. I think it's really especially tough in sort of the middle income countries where there's good research being done, a lot of um, research output there. Maybe they've been um, very able in negotiating low subscription fees through the years. And now as they are building their research outputs, potentially their costs will increase, right? And, and, and they need to preserve their local language publishing, for example. And this is, this is a huge challenge. And I think the only way to address it is to have conversations that bring these stakeholders together at the highest level of the ministries, because often the large commercial publishers negotiate at the level of the ministry for their journals. And without engaging the librarians who know what's happening around open access, without engaging the, 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 the researchers and where they're thinking and open science, right? And, and, and saying, why are we even talking about journals anymore? We should be talking about um, open science practices. So it's really, it, we really have to have these conversations together. And I think that, yeah, we do have an issue between Coalition S and OE 2020 and COARA. We are starting to have those, facilitate those conversations. Thank you, I fully agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yes. Uh, but uh, uh, in my question, there was the other part, if you do something that's not mainstream in your institution, even if you are in a very progressive institution, uh, what will you do? Do you need to do door scratching in order to explain to those in decision making that uh, there is a slow proportion of scientists that will be left behind during this transition? Uh, so, yeah, just a, that's just a comment. You know, it was a thought that I had. 
Okay, thank you. I think we have one more question. Is this right? Johannes from Copernicus. But, but I think I think you can do something as well. I mean, you can try to you can write to the the societies of the journals. You can write to the editors of journals, uh, asking them what to do. Put pressure on them. I mean, the way I flipped my journal, for instance, in 2015 was mainly because of reviewers telling me I don't want to work for Elsevier anymore, and I was concerned about not getting high quality reviewers. So that was one of the push factors. So write to the editors of the journals that you like and tell them they're not doing the right thing. And if they, these editors have a conscience, you know, <laughs> you might flip a have contributed to flipping a journal. Okay, um, let's have one last question from Johannes. Hi, Johannes from Copernicus here. Um, I have two questions related to the diamond initiatives that you've presented and the first one is related to long-term commitment so say a society approaches us and they want to flip their journal make a diamond what can i tell them i can hardly tell them maybe i can secure funds for two years and then maybe you need to you know flip back to gold they'll that, that's a huge risk for them right so i just wonder sort of what are the plans there and i would he like to hear from nicola as well how she secured funds for her diamond projects um, that's the first question. The second one, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit, but what does the CNRS tell French taxpayers um, when they invest in a diamond project and maybe in a particular year, not a single French publication has been published in that particular journal, right? I mean, we all agree that this investment is for open science, but um, maybe not loads of financial uh, or ministries of finance won't see it that way, right? So I just wonder, how you deal with that <laughs> okay let's okay, go to nicola first <laughs> to the first question yes thank nicola? you for the, yeah. the question it's a really I valid mean, question so just to clarify the open research europe which was the diamond open access journal i described i did not um, secure funding for that that was an initiative of the european commission and then i joined the scientific advisory board after it was after it was established and there the funding was put in place by the European Commission, which um, has a long-term vision for continuing to support that, that um, journal. But, uh, but it's, a, it's an extremely valid point that you know, if the European Commission changes its mind, then what happens to the journal? Absolutely, it's a valid point. But did you mention a few of the physics journals that were diamond? Physical around? review is gold. Um, the the, uh, the, the one that I run is, is gold open access. The accelerators and beams, that was um, put in place by CERN. So I guess it's also European um, European Commission money underlying it, and now has very many sponsors. Um, and again, it's a valid question if those sponsors all all pull out, whether um, CERN would be able to maintain it on its own, or if the American Physical Society would be able to justify um, stepping in to support the, the diamond diamond access option. Absolutely. I guess my follow up on this one would be: How can we establish sort of callback structures that? I don't know, act as a buffer for these diamond initiatives, right? If, I don't know, you know, political um, parties change, governments change, sponsor um, sponsorship circumstances change and so on, that would maybe be a solution that I think this is going yeah. to. Yes, it's a very valid question. Um, so some, of course, some learned societies are able to have the, the resources to support, support this independently. The Leopoldina has a diamond open access journal that one doesn't have to be a Leopoldina member to publish in. And I think most people are not aware of this. And so it's not yet been flooded with submissions, but in principle, anyone in the world can use this platform um, because the Leopoldina has enough independent funds in order to sustain this. But this is, I think, rare, even for a learned society to be able to, to do that. It's a very valid question. I don't have the answer. Maybe the others yeah. can comment. Yeah, so maybe, Another quick answer because we are running out yes, of time. I mean, well, first of all, Aura is a great initiative, but it's not fully fully diamond yet, right? It's it's open just to researchers funded by the EC. I know that's going to change by 2026, but right now it's not diamond. It's not diamond in another way as well. It's not owned by the scholarly community. Um, it's owned by the EC right now, and the the, the, the software is is by is is run by a private publisher. So, and it's a very specific model, right? It's post-publication peer review. So it does nothing for all the existing diamond journals out there. 
So that's why I'm, I think we need a capacity center, and I think we need to st start thinking about diamond publishing as uh, an international infrastructure. In the same way, for instance, as CERN is an international infrastructure or the square kilometer array or the telescope in Chile. That's the way we should fund it. I mean, and then you don't ask the question, well, did we use our time in the telescope in Chile this year as a country? Because it's just something that you do. You contribute to it. See what I mean? That, that, that is, the, again, the world that I hope we can move to. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. we have some agreement at the end. So. Yeah, so um, our time is over, unfortunately. I think it was a very interesting discussion and a lot of points were raised. And um, I think it's pretty clear that, um, well, the way to open access, it's not only one single way. I, I think we have to have different strategies and um, maybe some countries are a little bit faster, others not. Um, but yeah, I, I thank all our speakers. Um, I think it was great, there were great contributions. I thank the audience for, for the great questions and um, also Nicola online. And um, yeah, so I guess the discussion is not over. I mean, for today it is, but not um, for the time being. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I um, wish you a, rest, a good rest of your day and um, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.